It's like, <laughs> ah, thank you. Okay. There we go. That's all I wanted to say. Okay. Yeah. Well, anyway, just to say, I, I can't tell you how pleased I am that everybody's interested. I've been looking forward to this all summer. I've just done, I know I've kind of blown the summer on reading about this stuff. So I'm, I'm really glad to know that somebody else wants to talk about it too. It's just been a, a great experience. And, but I think it's helpful if you know a little bit about me, as Kay will reassure or underscore, I am skeptical and argumentative by nature. Uh, <laughs> if Kay says it's six o'clock, I'll say, yeah, but it's four o'clock at a different time zone. And then we'll take off from there. Uh, I'm searching rather than dogmatic. My my uh, uh, another way to put it, I'm supposed to say I'm confused rather than dogmatic. But but I, I I what matters most to me about religious life is the search for for God, and I don't think I found him in in all his fullness yet. So this is just part of that search for me. Um, it probably does help for you to know that for good for good or ill, I I come from a Calvinist background. And even in ways I don't even think about, but you will probably notice from time to time, boy, that sounds pretty weird, uh, or at least different from what you're used to. And I don't know that you should blame it on John Calvin, but at least it'll help you to know that uh, I'm coming from a, you know, a very distinct background. Um, and last and most important of all, I'm a historian. I taught history for 40 years. I've studied history all my, you know, all my adult life. I'm not a theologian. I taught a lot of church history with colleagues in the religious studies department where I was, but I make no claims to, uh, you know, when we start talking about what the true meaning of the sacraments are like that. I can't, uh, there's no way I can claim to offer an answer to those kinds of questions. I, I think we all have to answer those questions for ourselves, but certainly, um, uh, I will, uh, you know, if you got serious questions, you better better go to our priest or somebody like that who knows what he's she's talking about. Um, um, next thing is, I, I think today's kind of typical. I imagine we're always going to start with, and close with a prayer from Maria. Uh, after today, I envision there being uh, seven weeks where we talk about each of the seven sacraments one at a time baptism and so forth and so on. Uh, but today is more of an introduction and I'm obviously talking more than I should, but I figure I wanna lay the groundwork for us. Uh, the way I imagine it going each all of the remaining weeks is I'll make some introductory remarks. Uh, and then um, I picked out some film clips and things like that, that I think illustrate the sacraments and how they're portrayed in our culture. And I'm eager to see how you react to them. Some of them are obvious, some of them are obscure, but I think they're all provocative and illuminating and I look forward to uh, sharing them with you. Uh, and then I, the most important part every week is for each of us to talk about what our personal understanding is. And I'm anticipating asking many of us, if not every, all of us each week to say, it's, with one or two exceptions, we've all participated in many, if not all of the, the seven sacraments. And, you know, I want to hear about your experience with them, what it was like for you, what you remember about it, what you've been told about it, uh, what you appreciate or don't appreciate about it. But, you know, I wanted to, I think it's important to have a, a personal reaction to this. And that's that that's the goal. So come prepared to share. Okay. So actually, uh, Maria, can you put up the first picture now, the the, the, one, the medieval picture? Yeah. I brought some, I asked Maria to get ready to show us some pictures. And if she can do it, I want to just, I can, um, well, that's a good start. There mm -hmm. it is. Now, uh, I don't know what those, oh, there, good. I was gonna say, what are those things in the footnotes? Uh, can everybody see the picture okay? Yes. Great. I can make uh, it, and, and then we just have, like, how's that? Uh, I think you're better off going back down so they can see the full picture, if you okay. can get it down just a little. Yeah, great. Okay. So um, 
I don't have a lot to say about this picture, but I thought it was a good starting point. Uh, I'm curious to know, well, let me tell you a little bit about it. It's a painting by, you've probably seen it before. It's a very famous painting. It's by an artist named uh, Roger van der Weyden. It was painted around 1450 in the Low Countries. Um, and uh, as is pretty clear to you, I think, it's uh, it's an altarpiece that was designed to illustrate the seven sacraments. And uh, I don't know whether if you if you see the little gold angels over each one that symbolize each of the sacraments, you can see um, on the left side are uh, baptism and confirmation. And Where's confirmation? That's confirmation right here. Can you guys see my little hand moving? Yeah. That's confirmation right there. And then the next one is um, confession, I believe. Right here. Yeah. Yep. And I don't know. I I don't know the iconography. Obviously, each of the each of the angels uh, uh, is in the color that represents the uh, the sacrament. I I didn't know that there were colors associated with sacraments, but traditionally there are. On the right hand side, you see um, marriage. It's right here. And this is sacrament of the sick, right? Unction. Yeah, unction. And then here's marriage. And ordination. Where's ordination? The one on the left. That's yeah. ordination. Okay. And, and then, they ordination and marriage together because they're adult sacraments. And they represent the two approaches to Christian life, either marry or get ordained. The, the single life was not approved of, although obviously it occurred. Uh, and then in the center, of course, the to most of us, the most important of the sacraments, you see it in the back there, the um, is the, uh, the elevation of the host uh, during the Eucharist. Uh, and the, but the foreground is obviously the, uh, the crucifixion and the death of Christ. And it's a reminder that the the host is a uh, is a um, uh, uh, a recreation to say of, of the of the um, of the sacrifice. Um, let me just say a couple more things about why I picked this picture, other than it, I just think it's beautiful and it sort of gets them all together. Uh, the um, the picture was drawn around 1450, which was shortly after the church for the first time officially designated and defined what the sacraments were officially and limited them to seven. And I should make clear this is the Western church, uh, not the Eastern church. But it's only at the late, at the end of the Middle Ages that they, so this is sort of, this picture is not only is a medieval picture, but it illustrates for you the theology of the late Middle Ages beautifully. Um, the other thing you need to know about uh, this, I think that's worth knowing, this 1450 is right at the end of the, the hardest century in all of European history. In the previous hundred years, there had been the Black Death, which cut Europe's population by almost 50%, the Hundred Years' War, and just and coincidental with the Black Death and the Hundred Years' War, a religious revival. Uh, that, But it's on the eve of the modern world, or what we call the Renaissance, I guess. And just think what's going to happen in the 50 years after this painting was painted is Columbus is going to travel to America. The printing press is going to be introduced. Gunpowder is going to be introduced. And most important of all, from our point of view, the Reformation is going to occur. And it's the Reformation. Okay, so that this was our... Go ahead, Murray. Maria, did you want to say something? This was before the Reformation. I was asking, I was going to ask, this is before the Reformation. Yeah, this is just before the Reformation. Okay. Yeah. So um, when everyone was Catholic. 
I yes, guess. everybody in Western Europe. I have to always say Western <laughs> Europe because uh, there are other, you know, there are other churches that uh, that never adhere to this doctrine of the sacraments. Okay. And what so, what I wanted what I wanted to point out really quickly is because it is Catholic. It wasn't until Vatican II that the priests faced the congregation during yeah. mass. Yeah. And I don't know if that was if that was ever true in the Episcopal Church, but here he's facing away. So I just thought that was interesting. Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a mystery, it's a secret. You're not supposed to see it. It's well, uh, we can get to it later about all of the debate about how the how the sacrament should be administered, but but yes, it's certainly this is pre-Vatican II for sure. <laughs> That's a good point. Any other questions or observations about it? So does the the Orthodox Church have different sacraments, or do they? Yes, not yeah, I'll get to that. But basically, the Orthodox Church doesn't use the word sacrament; they use mysterion, the mystery, and there's not a defined set of seven. There are many more, as there were in the medieval church. The cutting the number of sacraments down to seven is a relatively late medieval idea. Um. And we'll talk more about that as we move on. Any other questions about the painting or comments? I hope you all agree it was it's pretty that it's worth seeing. I've, I've got a question. Yeah. Why do Go you ahead. Think, why do you think the crucifix is in the middle of the church and not the altar? The altar in the background is behind the gates, and that that. I think traditionally was meant for only the, you know, kind of the Holy of Holies, if you will, back there. Yeah. Why do you? That's a great that? question. And I, I, I don't know. I, I assume that even though it's a pretty representational painting that the, um, that in some sense, it's, it's a, uh, the painting of the crucifixion is not contemporary. That is, it's, it's sort of, it's in the foreground of the rest of the picture is the way I would put it that it's not so much that it's in the church as that it's in front of the church. That's the way I take it. Um, but I'm not an art historian, so there may be more to it than that. Certainly, though, the crucifixion is the the sacrifice of Christ is the, the central theme of all Christianity. So having it right in the foreground in the middle of the picture makes sense. Well, and it's his body and blood, right? Which is what's right yeah. behind him as well. But I think the sacrament is evoking the reality that we see in the picture, but would never be present in real life, obviously. Everything else in the picture could really be happening. The picture in front couldn't be simultaneous with it. So it's kind of like paintings from two different points in time and too many, two different places in space. I hope that'll do anyway. Okay. So let me, uh, how are we doing on time here? I, I didn't realize, I don't want to- It was 7.33, we're fine. Yeah, okay. So anyway, um, I guess we have to start out with some definition of what we're here to talk about. What is the sacrament? And um, it won't surprise you to know that uh, I'm, I want to be careful to be doctrinaire here to this extent. We're going to all of you probably re can cite to me from the Book of Common Prayer, but I'll read it to make it simple for everybody. The Book of Common Prayer describes sacrament as, quote, an outward and visible sign of inward and spiritual grace given by Christ as sure and certain means by which we receive that grace. And then it goes on, and this is what I think is wor worth underscoring, particularly for those of you who come from a Catholic background, is that the, the Episcopal Church makes a distinction between what it calls the sacraments of the gospel, that is baptism and Eucharist, and what it calls the sacraments which evolved in the church under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, confirmation, ordination, holy matrimony, reconciliation, and unction. So it's worth noting that in the Book of Common Prayer, there's a distinction made between the true, the not true, the two, you know, the two sacraments that are described in the Gospels and the other five, which are inferred or uh, discovered in there, but not explicitly defined. Uh, 
from a less theological point of view, uh, a sacrament is a Christian rite that is recognized as important and significant. So you see how you can get a lot more than seven. Um, and there are uh, traditions that have hundreds of sacraments that in the sense that there are lots of rites that are formed that are considered to have sacramental authority. Uh, in most traditions, a sacrament is held to be a sign or symbol of reality. In some traditions, sacraments are viewed as a means. It is worth noting that the Book of Common Prayer says specifically that the sacraments are a means by which we achieve. There's something we do in order to gain the 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 uh, 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 the grace. Uh, for other traditions, it's something we do in the hopes that we we receive the grace, or the in the faith that we have the. But it's not a it's not a cause and effect relationship. Um, it's important to note, sacraments all involve physical action in space. They involve the real world. So it's something that we see in the real world of nature that conveys religious meaning and has spiritual power. So another way is, and this goes back to the question about the picture, sacraments link time. We have the past in the initial baptism, the initial uh a Seder and so forth, present, that is something we're doing, and the promise of the future. All right, so the, the sacrament is a way of managing time, past, present, and future. Uh, some of you probably know this, but it's worth mentioning that the sacrament, the term sacrament, is not in the, is not to be found in scripture. The sacraments are the Latin word for what the Greeks used, mysterion, mystery, the, the sacred mysteries. Uh, and I'm not a theologian, so I'm not going to try to explain the difference between sacred mystery and, and sacrament, but there is a there is a nuanced difference there that's very important to theologians. It may interest you, maybe you already knew this, but it amazed me when I read it, that the original use for the word sacrament is that it was a soldier's oath of allegiance to the emperor. That in in earlier Latin, you read a Latin text from about the time of Christ, when you see the word sacramentum, it means soldiers are taking an oath of allegiance to the emperor. So huh. uh, it's not till about 200 AD that Tertullian, one of the early great uh, theologians, first suggested that they use that the term be used because just as taking an oath to the emperor involved becoming a, a Roman soldier. Uh, taking participating in the sacraments or the mysteries was an initiation into the christian community and that for and for tertullian uh the equivalent of the oath was the baptism and the eucharist that it's through baptism and oh. taking you go ahead Gloria. it's like you said it became a roman soldier well we become christian soldiers yes that's another way yes we're soldiers of christ uh, yeah. yeah i like that that's really yeah. cool it's not until we get 400 years later as the theory develops. It's St. Augustine, everybody's most famous saint, I guess, St. Augustine, who first introduced, uh, developed the term that we use. It's an outward sign of an inward grace. All right. It's not till then that, if you will, a kind of full theory developed. And it's not until the 11th century with the scholastic philosophers that the church started developing theories about how these actions actually work. It was assumed that they worked for a thousand years, but it wasn't until the 12th century that they started developing a, you know, a theoretical basis, a philosophical basis for how they might work. And that led to the church then narrowing down the number that could be regarded as true sacraments. And it's in 1215 for the first time that the church limited the number of the Western church limited the number of sacraments to seven. Now it's this tradition of seven. I've, I've, got a, I've got a question. Yeah, please. What do you mean by work? You said it's efficacious. In other words, how do how how do you philosophically explain oh, okay. how this miracle occurs? Now I get it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um you know if you're in a tradition 
Oh, uh, well, I'll get to it. But, you know, if you're in a tradition who who celebrate these activities but don't regard them as sacramental, then you, you're doing it. Like, for, for example, when you drink the wine and, and eat the bread, you can do it and think, I'm doing something that calls, that has consequences and something really occurs. Or you can be somebody who says, I just do this because it's a tradition and I want to manifest my adherence to this tradition. So the medieval church started developing ex philosophical explanations. Uh, we're not going to start reading Thomas Aquinas, you know, Summa Theologica, but, uh, you know, develop very formal philosophical theories of how it actually works, if you will. Um, which, uh, in any case, I want to get to is that, Maria, can you put up our picture now of uh, our other picture of the sacraments? Like, uh, yeah. Share screen. It should be familiar to you all. Share. Okay, it should take me to the next one. Uh, it's not going to, so I'll close this one. Close this one. Wow. Sorry. <laughs> Whoops, there it is. Yes. Sorry, let's try again. Sorry about that, guys. I think I got it there, and now we've got it. There it is. Yes. Hey, there we go. Everybody recognizes that, I trust? No, where's that? <laughs> yeah. Isn't that in the, in the columbarium? Is that where that is? Yes. Yes. Well, it's into the gate in the garden there. I is the whole thing called the columbarium? I don't know what the. Yes, I think it is. Yes, that is. It's that... Nicely modern, right? Very, very. Not only it's not a painting; it's 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 wrought iron. It's uh, yeah. abstract. Uh, I will admit, I couldn't. Uh, I had to get a cheat sheet to, to identify the seven sacraments there, uh, but they're there. Uh, this is this is two rings, so that's marriage. Yep, very good. This is ordination. Oh, this is unction, I believe. Six seconds of the yep. sick. Got it. And you're going into the oil. And this is communion. Yep. yep. The wafer and the. And the dove is confirmation. Confirmation. Uh, baptism, I believe, the the descent of the Holy Spirit. Oh, I thought that was confirmation. Okay. Well, maybe I'm wrong. I don't think so, though. Okay, where? What's this one? That's reconciliation, confession. Okay. And then this one. That's actually a, a symbol for the church. It's uh, the bull is a symbol of Saint Luke. Okay, and so this is this must be ordination, the keys to the kingdom. Yep. Mm -hmm. And is this what's this one then? Confirmation. Oh, okay. I would. I was thinking that because I always think of the dove as confirmation, and this is dunking them. And that would be the entrance to the faith baptism, but maybe not. I don't know. Nancy, do you know? Um, I would follow Paul's cheat sheet on this because okay. I'm sure that he got this information from Barbara, who has the historical background about the artist who put uh, these gates and others in around the church. But isn't it beautiful? Okay. It is beautiful. It is beautiful, and it's. But I, I, the other reason I want to show it is that I think it, it's beautifully modern, to me at least. But, I mean, in the same way that the Van der Weyden painting just sort of evokes the Middle Ages, this evokes the 21st century. The yes. kind of abstraction. Even, mm -hmm. uh, it's more mysterious. Even uh, though the, I think these gates were installed, probably. I don't know. 
exactly when. Um, well, okay, I'll say 20th century. I'll give you the 20th. Yeah, well, no, no, all I'm saying is uh, these gates are probably 40 or 50. Yeah. All of this artwork is 40 or 50 years old around the campus, probably. And, and it is beautifully modern. Um, so... The only other question I had is that I don't know that you anybody knows, but it struck me that um, given that the Book of Common Prayer says there are two gospel sacraments and five traditional sacraments, that they, that, that, so to speak, the the two gospel sacraments get top billing. It seems to me that it's the it's it's the two center uh, the upper center ones that are kind of the the ones that most catch your eye and the rest sort of circle around it. That's uh, um, just brilliant artistry, isn't it? Yeah. Great. Now, the last thing, uh, um, Maria, do you have one more? Did I send you a graph too? Uh-huh. I'm going right, to put that up. Bear with me. Let me open it so that I don't give you a tour of my computer. Oh, we enjoyed the tour. <laughs> I have it in that folder. Let me just open it up. At least there's nothing embarrassing. That's impressive. Thank, thank God. <laughs> okay, I think it's right here. Here we go. Nope, that's not it. I don't want to open that. I want to open this. screen it is this one it's 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 having a hard time pulling it up but well it's not indispensable if you get no it should come up sacraments yeah so oh, this is small let me try to make it larger hundred percent I just thought I that that's can you center it just a little more yeah great uh, I just thought it might help to say to, to, to start out by saying, you know, if, if if we get a random group of Christians together, and we're sort of semi-random, but we'll do, you're gonna have differences of opinion about what the sacraments are. And I thought if I gave you a little cheat cheat sheet, I copied this, I updated this off 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 the web. But as I go down the list, you know, there are some Christians, particularly Quakers and Anabaptists who think there are no sacraments per se. That is, these are commendable practices. They're not opposed to baptism. They're not opposed to a communion. They're not opposed to marriage, but they don't see them as sacraments the way the rest of us do. Uh, they see them as honorable or commendable practices. Protestants in the Reformed tradition, that's people like me and Kay, Presbyterians, Calvinists, only acknowledge two, baptism and communion. And that's because we, um, our tradition adheres to the notion that um, those are the two things, those are the two rites that we don't, uh, Christ participated in. He, he, he was president at weddings, and of course he was baptized himself. Um, no, not weddings, excuse me, baptism and communion. Yes, I mean, clear, I beg your pardon. Although he was at weddings too, but he didn't preside. Lutherans often, and one thing I've learned from 50 years of Minnesota is there are oh, many different kinds of Lutherans out there. Uh, but the kind of a lot of Lutherans regard confession as a third sacrament. Anglicans, that's us, and Methodists typically teach that there are two gospel sacraments and five traditional sacraments. But I, I couldn't resist the, you'll notice that the, the Anglicans are the one where, when the, whoever made up this chart, he didn't know what to do. So like, like he makes, he has three kinds of, of Episcopalians, Anglican Catholicism, uh, traditional Anglican and um, evangelical Anglican. And then there's, and then if you look for the broad Anglican, they say, maybe, 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 maybe. I just thought it was fun. <laughs> I don't know whether that really describes the, the Episcopal Church very well, 
but I thought it was interesting to see that even in trying to, the Anglicans are really a troublesome group of people to deal with from a theoretical <laughs> point of view. Um, Catholics and interesting enough, Hussites uh, regard um, them, there are seven sacraments, and ever since the Calvation, ever since the Council of Trent, Catholics have held that the uh, sacraments are necessary for salvation. They're obligatory. They're not voluntary, which is a modern uh, impression. And then the Eastern churches uh, just don't fit at all. They, they, they're all over the map. There are, there, there's, there's a much larger group of mis mysteries. Uh, the, these seven are included, but depending on which particular version of Eastern Christianity you encounter, there'll be many more or just the seven. Okay, that's it for pictures. Thanks. I found it interesting that the Mormon Church have the all the sacraments, yeah. but they do not baptize in the Trinity. They I don't didn't baptize. Know no, no, I don't know. I must admit, I don't know a lot about Mormonism. Yeah, either. because when we lived in Utah, the priest at the church we went to, he said the the most of the Mormons that became Episcopalians were rebaptized because they did not feel feel that their baptism was, was that yeah. one, yeah, that one. Yeah. Uh, so, so, and yeah. but they do yeah. they do baptize for their dead relatives. Yes, I think yeah. the Mormons are the only ones that allow baptism of the dead. Yeah, yeah. Could be I mean, wrong. and you get what happens is someone will get baptized in the name of that person that died a long time ago. Yeah. So that's very good. I should add that's very controversial because lots of modern day Christians have Christ have Jewish ancestors, and there's a bitter feeling among American Jews that people who died Jewish shouldn't be retroactively baptized yeah, yeah. later. But and, and if you died a, a Roman Catholic, I don't oh. think you want, well, if I don't know. I would not want to be baptized dying as an Episcopalian into the Mormon faith. <laughs> if I was going to become a Mormon, I would have done that when I was up. Yeah. What's What's interesting um, to me is that yeah, I spent a lot of time in RCIA teaching, uh, helping with RCIA in the Catholic Church. So this, the, that's the way Catholics come into the church is Catholicism recognizes any Trinitarian baptism, any Christian Trinitarian baptism. So if you want to join the Catholic Church and you're baptized Methodist or Baptist or Presbyterian or Lutheran, that's accepted. Yeah. Yeah. Do the same. Don't drink but our wine. Don't drink our wine. I was about wine. to say, but but they won't let you take communion. I will say, uh, speaking as a recent uh, uh, adherent to St. Luke's, that for me, one of the things that still surprises me each week is that um, if you're a Presbyterian, uh, the, uh, all you get is grape juice. And so it always strikes me that, hey, wait a minute, that's really wine. <laughs> when, I, when I dip my wafer in the, hmm, let's see, red wine. Yes, that uh, seems much more real. And, I and I'll tell you, Kevin, it's the same wine as at the Catholic Church. <laughs> it tastes exactly <laughs> the same. Yeah, I drink it in Catholic Church. It had a, a special Episcopalian taste, but it definitely tasted alcoholic as well. <laughs> and the, when I was went to St. Richard's, and Sid Gervais was the priest up there. We had port, so it so it was a little bit stronger, <laughs> but it was very good. <laughs> okay, I want to wrap up with two things, um, and uh, then we'll have a closing prayer. But um, first thing is, I want you to all at least give a moment. Next week, we're going to talk about baptism. And I have a couple of, I think, wonderful movie scenes that'll provoke discussion. But I'm most eager if everybody's willing to share a little bit about a baptism they remember. Now, for most of you, that's not going to be your own, although I would be curious if you've been told something, there may be an amusing family story that you've been told about your baptism. Uh, if not, presumably you've been to, we've all seen baptisms at, at St. Luke's. It's one of the most wonderful things about St. Luke's is the way we baptize. Uh, but I would, I'm hoping everybody will take a minute to say, this is an experience I've had, and this is how I 
viewed the experience and thought about the experience for each of you, whether for yourself, if you're old enough to remember, for a child, a grandchild, a friend, whatever. So that for sure. The other thing I want to say is one last way of thinking about the sacraments, of course, is that they're just markers for stages of life. You know, we go through life, time passes, you know, we're born and we're baptized, we start to study and we learn and we have confirmation, we come of age, we get married or we get ordained, we, you know, we, there are kind of stages of life. And it's important to recognize that there are most religious traditions have similar kind of rites, even though they don't call them sacraments. You all know what a bar mitzvah is, uh, but they're also... Um, um, a whole series of what are called sam samskaras in Hinduism. Uh, there are um, Confucian ceremonies. There are even, uh, well, last thing I want to say is if these are rites of passage, just for a minute, let's take a minute. Can any of you think of any secular sacraments in American life? What are What are things we do outside the church that say, Oh yeah, driver's, driver's license. Ah, very good. That was on my list too. Getting your own driver's license and soloing for the first time in your family car—that's a big graduation. Moment. Yeah, graduation. that's what I was mentioning. Our our <clears throat> nine and a half year old grandson is already looking forward to that rite of passage. <clears throat> graduation. We we went to our four year old grandson or five year old grandson's preschool graduation, and I went very cynical and, and dissolved in tears when he marched in. So it's definitely a it's a it's a moment. Um, any others? I think homecoming in Texas. <laughs> homecoming and prom. I was going to say prom. I think yeah. high school prom now has become a really big event, and um, uh, and we'll talk about some others. But um, I'm not Hispanic, but I think uh, uh, the Quintana. Kintanir. Yeah. Kintanir. Yeah. Well, at the risk of being a downer, the death of a loved one changes your life forever. Oh, yes. Yeah. Funerals would be, but, but, but that's, yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't mean to be a downer. <laughs> no. Well, if we're good Christians, it's not entirely a downer. That's all we can say. Okay. But yes, it's, that's it's, right. part, it's part of life. That's right. Okay, yeah, I, I got to say we're going through it in our family right now. I think some of you know our my son-in-law's um, father is dying. He's in hospice and expected to die sometime in the next couple of days. And it's definitely hanging over our family right now. It's just, mm -hmm. he's 90, yeah. he's 89. It's, a, it's, not, it's time, but that doesn't make it any easier. Like, uh, well, so that's it for me tonight. Uh, let's have some, uh, Maria, you want to close us with prayer and see if you,